Okay. Thank you very much to everyone for being here. Uh, this is the Alabama CubeSat Initiative Spacecraft Seminar Series. Today we have an exceptionally wonderful guest, Kathy Schimmels of the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, I will let uh, Kathy introduce herself, but we are just over the moon to, to have her. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And I will uh, take it from there, please. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so um, my name is Catherine Schimmels, Kathy Schimmels. I work at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, I'm a mission operations systems engineer. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in a few minutes when I get to the, uh, the next slide there. But um, I wanted to talk to you guys today about mission operations from a systems engineering perspective. And, uh, and, and I agree with something that Michael said earlier that everybody is a systems engineer. It just depends on the size of the system and the context of the system that you are responsible for, but everybody should be thinking as a systems engineer. So some of the key takeaways that I'm hoping you will get today after we complete this, this presentation is that what is mission operations? Mission operations is not just a thing you do. It is a fully designed system with functions, components, interfaces. It's a system that somebody needs to system engineer. We're going to talk a little bit about architecture of the mission ops system and that why that is the first step and some ways you can build that architecture. We're gonna talk about operability. What is operability and why is that a key facet and how does it apply to mission operations and also to the flight vehicle that you're building. Um, it's most important, not only in the ground system but in that flight system design. And we've identified at JPL within Europa Clipper uh, the nine aspects of operability that we think should be considered in all, all types of missions as you're building them or designing them. So operations exists to execute on achievement of the mission. So really what it comes down to is this is why we are here, right? This is why we are doing this job. We are trying to explore new places. We are trying to rewrite textbooks. We are trying to rewrite science and bring these discoveries to life and put this in everybody's hands, right? We are the facilitators that help make that possible. So that should give you a little bit of excitement going into this. Um, feel free to let me know if you have any questions as we go. So who am I? Why am I here? So um, I work at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and I am a systems engineer by discipline. Um, I graduated from University of Colorado Boulder uh, in 1993 and 1995, respectively, with a bachelor's and master's in aerospace engineering. I minored in astrophysics, planetary, and atmospheric sciences because I have this desire to know as much as I can about the science we're doing as well. Uh, and I really wanted to pair science interest with the engineering that goes with it to make it happen. So um, while I was in, uh, in school at University of Colorado, I worked for four plus years or so um, as an undergrad and grad student at the Colorado Space Grant. Um, I worked on three different space shuttle payloads, which flew, and uh, one small satellite proposal that did not fly. Um, but I got a lot of experience both in science and instrument operations, building, building actual components that, that flew on these space shuttle payloads. I learned how to solder. I learned how to do data analysis. I learned how to write a publication with the results from the, the experiments. I learned about mission operations, and I learned about project management. By the time I got to the third space shuttle payload, I was the project manager of the hitchhiker payload we did. So. Uh, so I got a lot of great experience um, while I was still in school, and at that point decided JPL was where I really wanted to be, because I wanted to work for a place whose customer was the general public learning about science. So I've now been at JPL over 26 years. Uh, I have experience both in, in systems engineering, mission operations, science operations specifically uh, is where I started. I've worked on four different flight projects. I've worked on the Galileo mission. Um, where I did science operations for seven years before we crashed the Galileo spacecraft into Jupiter at the end of its mission. I worked on the Dawn mission from phase B, which is uh, basically requirements, definition, and um, preliminary design stage, uh, all the way through getting us through our initial um, ion thrusting on our way out to, to visit Vesta and Ceres. I worked on the New Star mission, which was a SMEX. So these are all various sizes, right? Galileo is a flagship mission. It's a big mission. The Dawn mission was a discovery class. So you're talking smaller, but, uh, but still pretty, pretty decent sized 10-year mission has a lot going on. 
New Star was a small explorer mission and is still flying today. It is a small, um, a, an X-ray telescope uh, that was uh, built by several other organizations, but managed by JPL and flown by um, the University of California, Berkeley. And then after that, I've now moved back to Europa Clipper, which is another flagship mission going back out to Jupiter. So I've gone full circle from Jupiter around the solar system and back. Um, so why am I here? Um, obviously, my experience at University of Colorado Boulder led me to understand how important that was and how important learning from other people who have done this in industry really helped me formulate what I was interested in, what I wanted to do when I got a job. Every, every path I took sort of uh, would morph based on the things I was learning and the people I was making connections with. So, so I'm here to give you my perspective. Um, as, on mission operations systems engineering, uh, what to consider when you're developing this. The stuff I'm hoping you'll get out of this, but you can apply to any size project mission. You could do it on a, a CubeSat, it can be on a bigger mission, it could be on a satellite, it could be, you can apply the same concepts to pretty much anything you're trying to build um, to explore space. So um, overall, I'd love to share my knowledge, my experience, my passion for space, and I'm here to, to answer any questions y'all have. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead to the next slide. Um, so the agenda for today, we're gonna to talk about mission operation system architecture definition. Um, I'll get into a little bit about what the composition of a mission, system, a mission operation system is, uh, what are the functions it provides, what are the interfaces, things like that. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what an ops concept is. There's a lot of people, um, talk about a con ops or an ops concept or an ops con. There's different terminology that's used depending on whether you're uh, in industry, in academia, in military, et cetera. I will talk about the elements of the system design. What makes up this system and how do we capture those different elements in the system design? Other considerations, what about testing? What about training for operations? What do you do about contingencies when something goes wrong? Something will always go wrong. How do you prepare for that? Uh, then we'll talk about operability. And I said operability is an extremely important aspect. And there are these nine specific aspects of operability that we need to consider when we're building anything that we're planning on operating from the ground. So well, I'll talk a little bit about that at, towards the end. And then finally, I've got some backup information for you on definitions and acronyms. So as I'm talking, um, I don't know if anybody has slides in front of them or there's a copy out there yet, but um, please do know that you can look up the definitions and acronyms towards the back of the presentation for, for any clarification. All righty. So architecture and definition. So mission operations, it's a thing you do, right? No, it's actually a system. Well, why is it considered a system? Um, so a system is defined as a set of interrelated independent elements that carry out an objective. It's initially defined by an architecture. So think of a house. A house has an architecture, right? Um, that architecture has to take into account all of the different components of it, the electrical system, the mechanical structural framing of the house, the plumbing, et cetera, et cetera, the decor, everything that goes around it, right? Um, even your landscaping outside, all of it interrelates in some way. So the same thing happens with mission operations or any spacecraft. You have to define the form, the function, and the interfaces of the system. So what is form? Form is what does it look like, right? What are the pieces? What are the elements that make up the system? How, how does all that go together, right? And how, do you, how are you planning piecing that together? Obviously, you don't want an electrical system running right through your plumbing in a house, same kind of thing. You got to figure out what pieces and parts work together, how in the form of your system. What about the function? What does the system do? So one of the first things you're going to want to sit down and ask yourself is, what do I need my mission operation system to do? Does it need to be able to send commands to the spacecraft? Yeah, probably. Does it need to be able to get telemetry back from the spacecraft? Yeah, probably. Does it need to be able to uh, turn on a camera, take an image? Yeah, so these are all different things your system, the system itself needs to be able to do. But on the ground, that means you need to be able to understand how to command that camera to turn on and take an image. So identifying what those different elements of the system, of, that the system has, what those do, what are the functions they perform? And Mission Operations has a pretty standard set of functions. 
that we'll talk about in a few slides. So then the final thing, part of the architecture is interface. How do these various parts of the system connect to each other? How do you exchange information? What are the dependencies between the different parts of the system? And how does that information move between them? So, so you got form, you got function, and you have interface. Mission operation system, as the definition says above, you want an interrelated, interdependent uh, system that carries out an objective. So it is the collection of this, these interrelated, inter interdependent processes, so steps in which things have to happen so that you can actually carry out mission operations. What are your, one of the main things we develop are ops processes. Procedures, hardware, so what pieces on the ground, do you need a test bed on the ground, a system test bed that has all the uh, engineering models for the what's actually on the spacecraft? Do you have your um, on-console computers that you're using basically to command your spacecraft um, and look at your telemetry data? What is the software you're using on those computers? What do the facilities look like that you're gonna set up for your mission control and your mission support areas? And most importantly in a mission operation system, what are the teams of people that you need to actually carry this out? The mission operation system is usually a cooperation between teams of people and software that have to carry out the various functions and figuring out how to determine how much of that you want to be in software and how much of that you want a human to do is part of the design of your architecture. So, all of these things are interrelated, they're inter interdependent, and they all have to come together. It is it, it's interesting if you think about it, um, the mission operations system is one of the only systems in this space industry that actually includes people as a functional element of the system. So you don't just think of, well, somebody's gonna use the system, it's the people are part of the system. They have to be there. They have to perform the tasks. You have to think about how they are an element of the system when you're thinking about mission operations. They fulfill a role. Those roles have responsibilities. Those re roles and responsibilities lead to executing functions. So it really comes full circle in all of this other stuff comes together, but the people really tie it together in some way along with the software that they use. Okay. So now that you understand what an architecture is and how it would apply to a mission operation system, um, what does an architecture look like? I mean, how do you how do you define an architecture for, I mean, a lot of times if you're looking at a spacecraft design, you're looking at a functional block diagram. So that's one way of capturing part of an architecture, one viewpoint. Architectures are captured in with if you do that, if you do it right, in several different ways, several different viewpoints, right? What you're trying to convey in an architecture description should include all of the viewpoints of your stakeholders that they might want to know. So you want to be looking at, I want to show the functional view, or I want to show an interface view, or I want to show a geographic view, or you know, there's lots of different viewpoints you can consider when you're documenting your architecture. So what we've done here, um, on most of my examples are coming to you from Europa Clipper because it's what I did most recently. Um, but I will tell you a lot of, when we get into some of the details, a lot of the, the architecture of the generic mission operation system came from a model-based system engineering effort that we did called ops revitalization several years ago, where we dis defined essentially a, ge a generic mission operation system framework um, architecture that could be applied to any type of mission operations um, uh, for any almost any type of mission. Um, so you'll see a lot of the, the characteristics that we identified came out of that, and I can talk to that a little bit more when we get a little further. Uh, but in this case, what we've done here is give the real high level view of what the architecture needs to look like. For Europa mission operations, we were distributed operate. We are a distributed operations organization. So we are not just operating from one mission control center in one place. We have to have a mission support area, which is the same as a mission control center. Think of it that way. Um, we have one at JPL and we have one at Applied Physics Lab at APL um, out of Maryland. So um, we already have two separate locations we needed emission operations from. So you can see on this diagram, um, um, MSA West on the left and MSA East on the right. Now, 
in those MSAs, so this is mission operations is physically done from these two locations, right? This is where we perform the functions of mission coordination, uplink planning and sequencing, downlink analysis and trending, mission monitoring and control, looking at the telemetry that's coming down, navigation of the mission of the spacecraft, and mission data management. When we get the data down, making sure it gets processed, making sure it gets to the right places and gets distributed and stored for life of the mission and archive. So those are all the functions that happen there. Well, you might be going, well, where's, where's science? Where's the instruments, right? So if you look down below that, we have distributed instrument science operations and instrument operations centers. We call them ISOCs. So each of our science instruments has its operations at its home institution. And we basically set up our architecture to be able to allow them via cloud architecture to be able to receive data products and ingest them and look at them and use web interfaces to look at data and then to turn around and basically send command files over that interface in a secure way as well. So we are distributed all over the place. So that's kind of our, our, our basic architecture of mission operations in the middle there. Now we also interface with our ground data system. Our ground data system is the set of the software, the hardware, the networks, the facilities, and the infrastructure underlying all of that. We have shared tools that are used across all of these various locations. We have shared uh, test beds, shared models, sharing of data products. So the GDS or the ground data system is responsible for making sure that all of that information is, ex is exchanged, the right tools are provided, et cetera. On the other side of the interfaces, we have to be able to communicate with the spacecraft. So we have an interface with the DSN, the Deep Space Network. So uh, that could be an interface with the Deep Space Network. It could be with the Near Earth Network. It could be with TDRS. It could be whatever, whatever uh, communications network you're using. Then we have an interface with our science team. So our science team is all of the PIs and the co-Is and all of the people around the world who are helping to guide what our science requirements are, get that data, do the analysis and the collaboration, and come back with what actually is going to get released to the public. And so we have an interface with them that's different from the instrument operations people. So the instrument operations facilities are actually doing the day-to-day -day operation of that science instrument that's on the spacecraft. But our science system is part of our architecture that really is devoted to how do you do the science that comes back from those instruments. And then finally, that science system has the interface for doing the archive with PDS, Planetary Data System, and all the public release for all the pretty pictures that we all get to see when they come out um, once we actually get to Jupiter. So, and, and you can see in the upper right-hand corner, this is the geographic view of our architecture that shows how all of our, uh, where all of our MSAs and our ISOCs and, and stuff are located. Okay, so um, moving into the next step, another version of our, uh, not version, but another view, viewpoint of the architecture. This is what um, basically is the compositional need of the composition of the system and its external interfaces. So you will see some, some similar connections here that you saw before. You see the science system down on the bottom right. You see the interface with the planetary data system. You see the DSN. But you also now see that there's a flight system connected to our mission operation system. You also see on the on the right hand side that there is a um, sorry a launch vehicle that we interface with that has that's a ride that's going to get the, the the flight system. Now, yes, this launch vehicle also has an interface that goes over here to this flight system. But in the context of what we're centering on right now, we're not showing that in this picture. But the mission operation system in the middle is the thing we wanted to focus on here. So this is where we broke it into the composition. So it's built of, of a number of subsystems, just like you can think of a spacecraft or a flight system being broken out into a number of subsystems. Um, you've got your power subsystem normally, you've got your thermal subsystem, you have your mechanical and structural subsystems, you've got your um, guidance, navigation and control or attitude and articulation control systems. Uh, you have your payload. So think of those subsystems that make up the flight system. Now, here's the parallel of what that looks like on the ground. And so in this case, we have defined a set of six 
basically six subsystems that are important for mission operations for our, our architecture to support the architecture we have on Europa Clipper. Planning and sequencing. So this is how do you build the plan of what you're supposed to be doing and how do you sequence all of the information to, to communicate with the spacecraft. Spacecraft operations. That's the, the, the subsystem area that's responsible for the health and safety of the actual spacecraft itself. Planning the activities to maintain it, monitoring and predicting its behavior, doing the trending of the data that comes down to see if there's any problems, identifying and resolving any anomalies if they happen. Navigation operations is the subset of how do you get there? How are you getting to where you're going to go and how are you going to maintain your orbit if you're orbiting or your trajectory of how you're getting there? So uh, they plan and design trajectories to go to the place we're going. They monitor and determine the orbit. They plan and design the maneuvers to keep you on track or get you where you're going. Mission control operations. That's essentially what we call at JPL the ACE uh, or flight controllers uh, is another term that's been used. So these are the people that interface directly with the, the communications network. So with the DSN in our case, they send the command files to the spacecraft. They're basically the ones with their hands on the wheel driving the spacecraft, if you think about it in that way. Um, so they've got the command files that have to go up. They're monitoring the status and telemetry. They're alerting everybody if there is an anomaly. Um, and they're manage, helping to manage and distribute that downlink data to the right people. Science and instrument operations, we talked about a little bit on the previous slide, but basically how do you plan what science you're gonna do with the instrument suite you have? How do you monitor the instruments that are collecting that data to make sure that they are performing the way you want them to? So uh, building and, and building those command files, maintaining the instrument health, predicting what, um, what the behavior is going to be uh, of those instruments, getting um, validating the sequences and commands that have to go up, and then performing the data processing and the management of the science data that comes down to be able to send that off to the science team. And then finally, we uh, on the previous slide, you saw this as a, a sidewinder function on the left, which was the ground data system. So we consider that a subsystem of the MOS, and it is the underlying part of the MOS that literally has fingers in every other area. So the GDS has to support every one of these other subsystems. And their, their main function is to deploy, monitor, and sustain the facilities, the hardware, the software, the networks, the data storage, security, which is a big one, uh, infrastructure and overall system performance of the ground, of the ground system. So they troubleshoot any ground anomalies, um, you know, connectivity issues, that kind of stuff. So that basically should give you a picture of how you would break down a mission operation system into various subsystems and what their functions would be. Any questions out there so far? All right, I will continue. So. I have a couple, but I'll, I'll save them to the end uh, there. It, it's all about data interfaces. It's fascinating so far. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Michael. Okay, uh, so let's go into the second part. What is an ops concept? So you now know that you have you have you know you want to have a mission operation system. You know you want to put together an architecture for this mission operation uh, system, and you know that there are different viewpoints that you want to pull together. So how do you put all that together? What and and that's where this thing called an ops concept comes in. Okay, so an operations concept is also called a con ops, depending on especially military likes to use that term too. Um, it's a necessary early step in, your, in developing any flight element. Notice I'm not just talking about the ground and the mission operations anymore at this point. Developing your flight element, your spacecraft, and its corresponding operation system. So the operations concept really has to take both into consideration and talk about how, what your concept is for how the two will work together. So you're going, all these, all these, the development of the flight system and the MOS has to go hand in hand. Neither can really be designed independently without both being considered in this very first step. An operations concept is generally a document. Um, it can also be captured, it can be captured in terms of a wiki or a document or even a model, right? If you wanted to build it as a model-based system, you could capture your ops concept in terms of uh, your architecture and some other parallel information that you want to go with your architecture and, and your model-based system. 
your ops concept is considered a source of requirements, not just on the mission operations, but on the flight system as well. So your flight system, you may have a set of requirements that says the flight system has to be able to communicate with the ground once every seven days. Because if you don't, maybe your flight system has some consumable or some, something that is going to run out. A sequence is going to run out. Your ephemeris on board that controls, you know, lets it know where it is, might time out. Maybe there's some reason you have to be able to communicate with it every seven days based on its design. So um, making a requirement both on the flight and on the ground becomes important in your ops concept. So your ops concept of, gee, we're going to see it every so often and we have to be able to communicate with it every so often. So therefore, we need a requirement on the flight and the ground to do that. So uh, there's a difference, subtle, but there is, uh, between an ops concept and a mission plan. And one of the first things people do when they start to develop a mission, one of the first products they, they write is a mission plan. What is the mission going to do? Uh, but the mission plan really lays out exactly what it says, what the mission is going to do and how it accomplishes it. So it's bigger than just what the operations concept is, because the mission plan touches a lot more of, on what the flight asset is going to be doing. So what that flight system is going to be carrying out during its entire mission and how it's going to be carrying out. It's more the what than it is the how, right? So it's more Mission A is going to go to Mars, and while we're at Mars, when we're in orbit, we are going to take this kind of data at this altitude every so often, and we're going to communicate with the ground on this frequency, uh, or this, this cadence, essentially not frequency, that's a different thing, but yes, you also need a ground communication frequency. Uh, but then, you know, all the scenarios surrounding that get captured in a mission plan. If you take those scenarios and then you look at, well, what is what do those scenarios mean to operations, to the people on the ground and the system on the ground that have to carry it out, then you get into more of the how. How are you going to carry out that scenario? Is the spacecraft going to do it on its own and you're never going to talk to it? Because then you don't need much of a mission operation system. But usually there's some communication that's needed and there's some care and feeding that's needed. And understanding how that concept comes together Really, it's just a capture of taking those scenarios and stepping into the shoes of the mission operators and thinking about what you need to be able to do and how what you need to be able to do drives the design of your spacecraft and the design of your ground system, um, and particularly how it drives your software design as well. So it is a big source of requirements across the mission. Um, ops concept. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's basically carried out by the people in the software on the ground. So just giving that consideration and stepping into those shoes as you're developing. Um, so that's that's really step one when you have an architecture is what is the concept first? Then you can start to take that concept and, and build your pieces of your architecture into place and see how they're all interrelated. So a little more detail on what an ops concept should include. Number one scenarios, we talked a little bit about this. So um, the what and the how the flight element will carry out as its objectives in every phase. So you probably want a scenario, usually you break them out by the different kinds of things your, your mission is gonna have to do. So documenting the scenario for launch and acquisition of signal after you've been deployed. Your solar array deployment, your instrument power on and checkout, um, sensor calibrations you might wanna do. So you're gonna wanna lay out scenarios for what how operations is going to do each of these various phases of mission operations. If you have a flyby, or if you are having a, an orbit insertion, um, even all the way down to de decommissioning and disposal. So um, you can break it out by what phase of operations you're in. You can break it out by the type of operation you're doing and whether or not like instruments are involved or not. Um, it's really up to the author to figure out the best way to capture those scenarios. Secondly, the, the second uh, part of the framework of an ops concept is the composition. What does the system look like? And that was that diagram I showed a few slides back that would show what the subsystems are. What are the pieces of your, of your mission operation system? So at this point, you've now said, these are scenarios of the things we want our system to do. Now, here's the pieces we need to help make it happen. So do you have a ground data system as part of your system? Probably. Do you have a science data system? Maybe you do, maybe it's separate from your architecture. Maybe it's something that the science teams actually hold the science data system separately. Um, that again is an architectural choice you can make. 
what teams and what subsystems do you think are part of what your mission needs? And if you're talking about a, a landed mission on Mars, you may be talking about a section of your mission operations system that is focused on relay operations, where your, your surface element is sending your data, the uh, sending information through an orbiting relay asset at Mars. So you may want to have a relay subsystem that you're going to talk about. Um, so what are the physical parts? Do you have a mission ops center? Do you have a science ops center? Do you have multiple op centers like, like Europa Clipper where you're distributed? Um, do you have separate data processing locations? You know, Caltech is used for a lot of science data analysis. Um, their Goddard has a lot of science data analysis centers. Um, which ground communication antennas are you going to be interfacing with? Not just the antennas, but really what's the network? Are you using the DSN? Are you using NEN? Are you using TDRS? That kind of stuff. So that's the next part you want to figure out. And then once you have those pieces, now you got to figure out how they talk to each other. Um, you have not only interfaces within your system of your different pieces, but you also have interfaces external, like we talked about before with the launch vehicle and the deep space network and other or other comm networks, interfaces with the data archive systems you're using. So coming up with those external interfaces is, is step one. Uh, we're working on your internal interfaces is kind of step two and gets into more of your design. Um, and then finally, uh, the most important thing to really think about is what kind of constraints are on your mission, right? Are on your and on your operations design. So what kinds of things are you really being constrained to? What boxes are you being constrained to fit in? So for instance, if you have a deep space mission, you're pretty much constrained to use the deep space network. There's not really anything else that can communicate out there. So um, that would be a constraint. You may also have constraints that come from your mission on the duration of the mission, the cost of the mission, the cost of the operations of the mission. Um, typically, when you're costing a project or a mission, the mission operations portion of that, um, for the, for the actual operations costs, usually end up being about 10% of the total cost of the entire project. Uh, that's just kind of a, a rule of thumb. Um, but you may have other constraints uh, partnering with other institutions. You may have an international partnership that you need to, to deal with. And so you need to think about ITAR constraints and sharing of information um, outside of you know, within the US, for instance, um, facilities that you are required to use uh, and partner with. Um, then you get into things like, gee, this mission is going to be going around a planet and on some at some points we're not gonna have communication with it or it's going to be on the dark side and it's not gonna have the right lighting. So you start dealing with things on your on your scenario side due to the constraints on geometry, lighting uh, conditions, eclipse durations. For Europa Clipper, we have requirements on the total ionizing dose of radiation that we can have because Jupiter and Europa have a very high radiation environment. And so we dip in and out of it, but we have to track that. That, because you have to track it and know about it, means you have a function on the ground that you need to put into your system. So we have to be able to track the radiation environment, get data down about it, analyze that data and understand how it's affecting our spacecraft. Same thing with eclipse durations. How, you may have a constraint that says how long of an eclipse you can your spacecraft can tolerate, but you need to know on the ground how you're going to track that, right? How are you going to know when you're going to be eclipsed? How are you, what software are you going to use? How are you going to know uh, if you're if you're going to be in eclipse longer than you're supposed to, so that you can go? Whoa, wait a minute, we have a problem. Um, how are you going to track you know the geometry of the spacecraft and communicate that to your science team so that they know when the proper time is to be able to turn on their instrument? So all of this, even though they're they're constraints on this on the the mission and the mission plan, you can see how they come back to being constraints on what you need to do on the ground. Um, finally, power, data volume, other consumable resources, because we actually have to make sure that any sequence we put up can be executed safely and within the resources that the spacecraft has. So if you have a finite amount of data storage and you have 10 instruments that all want to use it, you have to be able to know that what you're putting up there isn't going to fill up the entire data storage with one instrument's data and leave the other ones hanging. So uh, you need to be able to balance your power, uh, understanding what your power generation is, what your power use is, um, and basically being able to model that on the ground and track it. 
because of constraints that may be put in place on how much the vehicle can actually generate and actually um, what the instruments and everything else use. So those are some examples of some constraints. For those uh, those power constraints where you're saying if I want it to execute these behaviors or use cases or, or for a given sequence, are you modeling how much power that's going to consume on ground or is in then uh, uplinking an expectation and then it's checking on orbit? Is all of the analysis for that done on the ground or, or is it a hybrid on ground or in, in orbit? That's a great question. Um, we do um, we do all of it on the ground. Um, I think the only thing what happens on board. So we would we would basically build power models based on um, what we call the Pell the power element list, basically that uh, would tell us how each component uses power in each of the different modes. And so we build that into our grant software. We do all the analysis before we put the sequence up. So we know that yes, it should work. However, if you get up there and something is not behaving the way you thought it was going to, there are checks in place with fault protection, basically that would check things like the battery state of charge. Battery state of charge is getting too low. We're gonna turn things off, right? And you're gonna stop, you're gonna load shed and you're gonna stop using, uh, using power. Um, and so, but that's all done as an after the fact. It doesn't check it before it executes necessarily. It's watching for any thresholds that might get tripped and you're, the ground is being told about it, but the spacecraft will keep itself safe, essentially. Does that make sense? That does, thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to the next section. So elements of the system design, this is where we get into a lot more detail. <clears throat> so hold on to your hats. Okay. Um, so. How does this all get pulled together, basically? How does it all come together? So this is what uh, a design process that we've sort of uh, settled on. This actually came from a design process, um, uh, of the MOS design framework that we did in, the, in our model-based system engineering efforts um, as to what the different components of the architecture need to be. And so basically this gives you a, a really big picture bedsheet kind of view of how everything fits together and how you're building, how you're designing your system. So you're gonna start at the beginning with these, uh, your ops concept that we just talked about. So you now have a concept and you know your concept has composition, it has external interfaces, it has all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, basically in your ops concept, your scenarios and your constraints and all that. So you've got that and you come up with some use cases of, of what these scenarios would, would look like, right? So out of that, you're gonna drive a set of requirements. Everybody has to have requirements on the system. I uh, can't get away from that. Um, and I'm gonna go into each of these separate areas in subsequent slides. So I'm just gonna give you the quick overview of how it all flows together. So your requirements get allocated out to those subsystems we defined. So your composition includes all your different subsystems. So here's all of our, our subsystems within the MOS. We've got a set of requirements at the system level and we're gonna now allocate those down to each of these subsystems. So the spacecraft team may have an allocation for a requirement that they need to monitor the telemetry and that they need to build predicted telemetry that they can check against based on the behavior models they're running. Uh, a navigation requirement to be able to execute a maneuver in a certain amount of time or to build that maneuver in a certain amount of time. So once you get those requirements in place, um, these uh, and they're allocated to your subsystems, then your subsystems develop a flow down of their requirements. What does, he, what does that mean for their subsystem to actually develop? So you get a level lower in your requirements. Those requirements define a set of functions. Uh, basically, uh, their functional requirements are saying you need to perform this function. So now you can get out of that a list of functions. Your functions are fulfilled by operations processes. Operations processes, you will talk about in a little bit, but it's a step of all the things that need to happen to make something uh, true, essentially, to, to meet an end goal. So we build a set of processes that fulfill those functions and do those things. Within your processes, you have different teams that are doing different things in, in operations and they have interfaces. Well, how do you document those interfaces? Well, we build what we call operational interface agreements, which is a one pager kind of thing that documents what the interface is between two teams for a given process. Within your process, you have your teams who are gonna do things. Those teams 
have roles within their teams. You might have a sequence integration engineer, you might have a mission planner, you might have a spacecraft systems engineer, you might have a thermal engineer, right? So you've got different roles that are being uh, asked to carry out these processes. The roles are all built, put together into a team. Now notice teams is over here, subsystems is over here. Your teams are part of your architecture. Your teams are part of what you're building. They're part of your system. Your subsystems are how you're breaking out your system, but they may not be the same thing. So you might have a spacecraft team subsystem that develops how spacecraft team is going to do the operations. But then when you get to operations, you have a spacecraft team. So they are two separate parts of the architecture, but they're very similar. And a lot of times they're one-to-one. -one. Um, finally, your roles then are going to execute detailed operations procedures, which say do step A, B, C, look at data, then do D, E, then build this command file, then send it up. So you get a lot more detailed when you get to your procedures. Now, you can see all the stuff in blue is what the, the mission operations system does, but we talked about the ground data system and how it's a very important part of the MOS. So everything in orange down here is, is a similar design flow for what the ground data system needs to look like. So out of your subsystems, you have uh, the ground data system considered one of those subsystems. So you have ground data system requirements. Same thing at the same at a different level. Now you have another set of subsystems, all the ground data subsystems, which are, are divided into functional areas of what software you need to be able to carry out all of the, the, the functions that the MOS needs to do. So we have a bunch of allocated requirements that go to the different kinds of software. Um, we have uh, each of those GDS subsystem develops a lower level set of software requirements on individual tools. And then those software requirements on those tools give you a set of software capabilities. Those software capabilities are what you need to perform those MOS functions. So they really go hand in hand. Your software cap capabilities are fulfilled by the GDS software and data flows. So the actual software that is delivered and the data flows between the software. So, and the way that we capture what those interfaces are is called a SIS or a software interface specification. And so this basically gives you, and, and what's interesting is that we actually built our model-based architecture. Each of these, this is basically rep a representation straight out of MBSE of how we designed this architecture and what the relationships between these different elements was. And we basically adapted that for Europa Clipper and, uh, and are, are moving through this design process now. Now we are in, um, as I mentioned to Michael earlier, we're in phase D. We are about a year and a half from launch on Europa Clipper. And um, so we have done all of the design of all of this, but we're not complete. So I would say we have done, our requirements are done, they're allocated. We have the functions defined. We have the processes defined. They're stable, they're baselined. We know what our roles are. We know what our teams are. We are in process of documenting our detailed operations interface agreements. So we have about 85 operational interface agreements that we've defined. And they're all preliminary right now, but once we get into test and training and we make sure that they are right, then we will baseline them. Uh, and then we're in the middle of writing all of our ops procedures right now. So we're at the point where we're getting into the final details of the, of the, the, the design that then you can test and you can train people with, and then you can roll out the final versions and be ready for operations. GDS has built most of the software, but not all. There's still some in work and we have incremental deliveries of software that we will test with and improve once the users see it. And so, whoops, did not mean to do that. Um, so we've built out most of our software capabilities, but there's still work to go there. The concept of an operational interface agreement is really interesting. The, the students are familiar with interface control documents. <laughs> If ICDs are uh, the, the interface control agreements for subsystems, could an operational interface agreement be considered an ICD for personnel? How does, how, what's the relationship there? Um, it's sort of an, an operational interface agreement is between teams. And I do have a slide on this a little bit later, but um, it, it's, it, it's an interface between teams and between people, really between people and how those people are gonna exchange information. Whereas in an ICD, you're you kind of know the information, you're you're 
it, it's still an information exchange, right? So like if you, well, let's see, if you're talking about a piece of hardware, you have an electrical ICD and maybe a mechanical ICD, right? That specifies what those interfaces are on both sides. But um, if you're talking about a flight to ground ICD, for instance, you're talking about what does the flight element going to have on its end? What is the ground element gonna have on, on its end and how are they gonna talk? Same thing for this. It's just, instead of each of those interfaces listed, we break those out into a little more detail um, for an operational interface agreement where it is between the people, right? Team A, this role is going to develop and deliver um, a sequence one week before uplink to the sequencing team. That's the kind of thing that would go into an, mm. an operational interface agreement. Um, the NAV team is going to deliver an up updated SPK file for the trajectory one day after receiving the uh, orbit determination data, you know, after a maneuver or three days or something like that. So it gives you the timing and the frequency and the location where that information is located so that an ops team member can go get it. So, but the, whether you do it in an OC, in ICD or whether you do it in a special operational interface agreement, which we've defined this for this you know idea of a format for, um, it's all the same information. You want to capture the same interface information. Awesome, thank you. I am looking forward to the next the the slide on it. Okay, sounds good. All right, so there's your big picture. Let's get into the details. So the first one, requirements, requirements, requirements. Everybody has to do requirements. Um, and so you have to define what the system is gonna do functionally. How is it gonna perform? How well does it need to perform? How quickly do you need things to happen? Um, with any kind of mission that's in space, you may need a ground in the loop turnaround time. You have to consider things like one-way light time. So how quickly do you need the ground to be able to turn something around if you have a, let's say a 90 minute flyover pass with an earth orbiting mission. How quickly in that 90 minutes do you have to do something on the ground if you have to do it over a contact? Or if you have a long mission, like uh, you know a deep space mission like your Epic Clipper, you have a one-way light time. So if you have an eight hour pass over, over the deep space network antennas, then maybe you need to have be able to do something in an hour or two hours or four hours so that you have enough time to get data down, do something and respond to it within that eight hours. Those are the kinds of requirements you want to write on your on your performance of your system. Um, are there quality attributes your system must have? How, what is the quality of the data that you need to make sure it actually makes it to into the hands of the operators? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, Requirements are shall statements. They're not shoulds. They're not goals. They're like, they're not, it'd be nice to's, um, but they are shall. You have your system. If you write a requirement, make sure you really need your system to do that. Because when you get to the point where you've written a requirement and you go to test it and you go, well, can't really do it in three hours. We can do it in four though. I guess that's okay. No, you wrote a requirement for three hours. There's a reason. You have to have a reason for why you put three hours in that requirement. And documenting the rationale for that requirement is really important because the person who is testing that requirement maybe years down the road will not know why you said three unless you tell them why you said three hours. And they might not know if four is okay or not. And they're gonna and they're gonna fail the requirement. And that causes everybody to go back and do rework. So you always want to make sure that if you are putting something in a requirement, you really need it and you really understand why you need it. So always ask those questions. Um, examples. So a couple of good MOS requirements. Monitor the power and the thermal states of the spacecraft and instruments during every downlink pass. Now that can mean a lot of different things, but it's a good starting level requirement at the system level, what we call level three, which is basically the system level. Um, MOS shall plan and validate spacecraft pointing against flight rules and geometric constraints. So we need to plan how we're going to point the spacecraft, and that plan cannot violate a flight rule, which I'll talk about what flight rules are later if you, if you aren't familiar with them. And it can't violate the geometric constraints like pointing at the sun right, and burning the instrument optics. Um, you also need to be able to validate that the spacecraft pointing does not. Once you actually built what it's going to do, you want to make sure that you're planning it such that it's not going to violate a constraint, but then you check that it, it, it's not going to violate the constraint before you actually uplink it to the spacecraft. 
So this is one of those kind of two part requirements where it might be better to split it out. But, um, but those are some ideas of what a functional requirement on the MOS would look like. The kinds of things you need to do to keep your spacecraft uh, functioning healthy and safe. So that's about all I want to say about, well, not all. Okay. Um, so not all requirements are, are uh, not all cons uh, constraints are requirements on the system. So we talked about requirements, but earlier we talked about constraints that are in your ops concept. So you have an ops concept that you said, okay, there's all these constraints. Some of those constraints are going to become requirements on your system, but some of them are not. A constraint that says don't point the spacecraft at the sun because you'll break it is, is something called a flight rule, basically. It's not a requirement on the design of your system. It is a rule that you need to abide by when you are operating your system. So there is a subtle difference there, but it's important to think about. Is there a subsystem design element and a function that, that I'm putting into my emission operations system that, care, that makes sure that the spacecraft doesn't point at the sun. No, there really isn't. What you're building is the ability to check and see if you're pointing at the sun. But the flight rule is the thing, the constraint that you're actually checking against. And so you will find that there are things that's kind of tough sometimes to dis discern what's what, but uh, flight rules are not requirements. They are constraints and guidelines that provide guidance for the operators basically to conduct safe and efficient operations and, and not break things on board the spacecraft. They are constraints that a lot of times come to you from the builders of the of the flight vehicle of the spacecraft. Um, one example, turn on the heater at least 60 minutes prior to powering on an instrument to avoid damage to hardware. Okay, so that's something I have to do using my capabilities and my mission operation system, and I need to make sure that I check it, but that doesn't design that my sequencing team has to have a certain uh, uh, function they need to carry out to do that. They're still building a sequence. It's going to go to the spacecraft. So the, the most important thing is that you are constraining how the operator is operating the system. Don't point the instrument at the sun after cover has been deployed, those kinds of things. It's all health and safety related. So think of flight rules in that respect. Um, okay, so let's move into functions. So we talked about requirements. Requirements are going to define what the functions are that you, uh, your functional capabilities or system has. Um, we basically came up with on an, in our multi-mission MOS uh, design of our, our system architecture, a set of core functions that almost every mission operation system has. Um, and this sort of represents that. And when looking a little closer, we realized that there are a certain set of them that really come into play in more of a loop. They're all more interrelated. They all have to happen. They're all important functions, but some of them happen on a, on a certain cadence, essentially, for a mission where you're really closing the loop. And it's been called close the U, it's been called close the, U, close the loop, but really you're closing the loop between uplink and downlink. You are basically executing, so let's see, where's a good place to start? Because it is a continual loop. But um, let's say you have a mission, you updated your mission plan. Um, you then are generating an uplink product. Uh, you're, you're planning your specific sequences and you're, and you're generating those. You approve them and you're going to put them up on the spacecraft. So up here on the spacecraft, they're executing. Now, during that, you're going to communicate with the flight system because you're uplinking and you're downlinking. So this is where everything kind of meets at the top. When you're downlinking, you're gonna assess your flight system health and performance of the system. You're gonna get telemetry data in real time. You're gonna get your data products downlinked afterwards. Um, and then you're gonna generate standard data products out of that that are gonna be looked at by your teams or go to your science teams. You're gonna store and distribute that mission data to the appropriate people. Once they get that data and you see what happens, you're going to feed that back forward decisionally into updating your mission plan again. What are you going to What are you going to do next week instead? Right? If you think about a um, a Mars rover, right? They're doing this on a much tighter time cycle. So they're saying, where are we going to drive tomorrow or next week? Right? And they're going to build build a, a drive plan and they're going to uplink that drive plan and they're going to, you know, get the relay data after the fact that says, yes, here's what we did. And they're going to get their products down and then they're going to plan their next drive. 
So this same kind of thing can happen on, on any mission. That's what we mean by close the loop. Um, within that, there's other slight you know, differences on, on other kinds of use cases and functions. So you have to be able, in order to communicate with the, oops, sorry. In order to communicate with the flight system, you need to be able to configure and operate the deep space network. How, what, are the, what are the settings for the, the communications paths? Um, not, we don't just send up sequences. We also sometimes send up real-time commands, um, where you're literally, you know, and sometimes on earth missions, this is, you're on the, you're on the console and you're just literally just like executing a procedure and it's sending up commands, you know, bam, bam, bam. Um, controlling and predicting your trajectory. Uh, and that's the navigation part of it. Scheduling how much network coverage you need with the DSN, because we know the DSN is getting really oversubscribed. So that's a big function for mission operations now. There's so many missions out there right now flying. There's 40 more coming. There's Artemis. There's all these missions who need deep space network coverage. So that scheduling of what you need for your mission and negotiating it is an important function that mission operations has to do. Um, outside of that loop, there's other things you have to do within a mission operations. You need to be able to respond to anomalies. You need to be able to identify how you will respond to anomaly. What information do you get? What you do with that information when you get it? Updating and maintaining your flight software for your spacecraft and your instruments. And that includes firmware if you have reprogrammable FPGAs that you need to make changes to. Status and communications. That's a big one. You need not, and that's not just providing your status and communicating to NASA headquarters, that's part of it, but what is the status and the communications and how do you do that within your teams, right? Do you guys meet every Monday morning at 8 a.m. for an hour and have, you know, stand-up meetings where you talk about what you're going to do that week? Do you meet every day? Do you meet every two weeks? How many meetings do you have? Planning that out is actually part of mission operations systems engineering. Uh, managing mission operations. What does the mission manager need to do? What are their roles? What do they approve? How do you waive violations of guidelines, things like, or flight rules, things like that? That's a whole nother set of functions. So this, this is kind of big picture, but the only thing you don't see on this list, because this is specifically one for Europa Clipper, this is what we settled on for our use cases, you, you'll notice there's no relay here, right? In, in a, um, a surface mission on Mars or something, you would want a relay operations function. Um, for some Earth orbiters, you may want some other ha station housekeeping kind of you know, uh, operations. It, there's, there are other functions that may come to light, but that's the job of the system engineer is to think about, is everything that I need to do fit in these boxes or is there some, something that's missing and I need a new function that I need to put in? So what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, I'm going to leave, leave this more for, you know, just, just as an example, but you'll see there's two yellow boxes around here. I'm going to show you how we break down one of these functions. I would call this, we've used interchangeably use case and function when we're talking about this, because the function is performed by, remember, a team and a role, but a use case is also how does an operator or a user use the system. So they're interchangeable. Uh, in an architecture sense. So we have identified two use cases um, to talk about a little further, communicate with the flight system and assess flight system health and performance. And what the next step that you would do is break out each of these functions or these use cases into a scenario of what that means. What does it mean to communicate with the flight system? So this is an example of how we have captured uh, the communicate with the flight system scenario. You have a set of inputs to your scenario. You have the steps that happen in the scenario, including some parallelism, uh, and then you have a start and an end, and you have the outputs of what happens at the end of that scenario. And this helps you start to figure out how your different teams are gonna carry out the functions. Because first step is what has to happen. Then the step is who's gonna do it. <laughs> so in this case, we talk about you know, we're going to start, we have a pre-pass uh, instructions with the ground station, you know, telecom information is all provided. We start the, we're getting ready to start the, the downlink session. Um, you know, alarm updates are set so we know what red alarms uh, are, how they're configured so we get the red alarms. 
Um, but basically, once the configure ground station is ready at the beginning, then all these steps happen. Um, at the end, you close out the session. And out of that, you now have your radiometric data from the past. You have your flight system data that comes down in your, your space link extension frames. You have your CFDP completeness reports. And I know that there was a previous uh, talk um, on CFDP, which is, uh, um, oh, gosh, I'm totally blanking on the acronym now, um, file delivery protocol, um, CCSDS file delivery protocol for being able to get data down with an, in an accountable sense. Um, you have reports on the spacecraft status based on your real-time telemetry. Is it healthy? Is it safing? It was good. Everything looked green. Were there any red alarms? And you have your uplink confirmation report of here are the files that got on board safely. So this is an example of, of a scenario. Now you could draw this scenario any way you wanted, but these are the things that we thought were the important steps basically in capturing a scenario for communicating with the flight system. Second one. Similar kind of thing. Um, you can see that there are a couple of yes, no points in this one. Um, but you, if you need to assess your flight system health and performance, uh, what does that mean? What kind of data are you going to get? When are you going to get it? And who's going to look at it? And what kind of checks do they need to do? And what kind of software are they going to use to do it? Now, the scenario will not get you to the level of identifying the specific role in the scenario, those, those are handled in what we call the processes, which come next, a little layer of detail. But in this case, you've got new, new flight system information, just came down through that communicate with flight system thing that we just talked about. So now you've got this data, what are you gonna do with it? So you, depending on what state it, it's in, you may have to do some transformation. You're gonna use it to perform initial health checks. You're gonna look at your alarms. Do you have red alarms telling you that something's out of range? If everything's in acceptable limits, continue. If it's not, gee, you're gonna jump out to another scenario, which is called anomaly response. Same thing here. Are the states nominal based on the analysis, your initial analysis? Nope, not nominal. Jump to the other scenario. So it's basically a flowchart. tells you what you're gonna do. And then you're gonna dig into each of these in a lot more detail as you continue your design. So, um, Internal interfaces. Let's go into this part, the gazentas, the gazatas. So you've got internal interfaces between teams, which we talked about the operational interface agreements or between software applications, which that was the software um, interface specifications or CISs. Um, as I mentioned before, the operational interface agreements, uh, operational interfaces um, can be captured in ICDs or in OIAs. And it's really up to, how a project wants to do it, what their heritage is from the, the, where they're coming from, what kind of missions they're following, you know, it's just, it really is sort of organizationally dependent on how you want to do it. Um, but the key is, what is the information? What products are, are exchanged? How often are they exchanged? What is the format that they're going to be in? What is the content that's within them? And where are they located? And for uh, to, to really tie it back to the big architecture picture, we tie in and which process does this interface apply to? Which ops process? So um, software interfaces, we capture in software interface specifications, which really talk more about um, the specific, this software is going to put out these, this information in this format. And you know, so you can build an interface, an API, basically. Uh, if necessary, between software and, and applications, or you know what API to conform to if you want to be able to grab information out of a given software tool. So there's not a lot of detail here, but that's the general idea. Uh, external interfaces are a little bit different because they get a little bit bigger. They're between organizations in, in most ways. So usually you have either a service agreement an MOU, which Memorandum of Understanding, or an ICD. So flight ground ICD, we talked about a little bit. That's between the flight element and the MOS. What are your uplink and downlink rates? What are the CCSDS protocols that you're both going to conform to? What are your command and telemetry formats you're using, et cetera? A launch vehicle ICD is between the project system, not just the, the mission operations system, between, but between the spacecraft developers and the mission operations and the launch vehicle service provider like SpaceX or Artemis or whatever. Um, and that usually includes the electrical and mechanical and the data flow interfaces, 
the tracking interfaces, the ground services required at the point where you're integrating your spacecraft to the launch vehicle, um, and all the separation and deployment details, because ops needs to understand what happens after the spacecraft separates when and gets deployed when they're looking to make contact with it. Uh, your comm network service agreement. What kind of service agreement do you have with the DSN or the NEN or any other comm network um, for the, the interface to get the data back to you and to get your commands to the spacecraft? So how many passes? What antennas are you going to use? How often? What are your data storage and data flow requirements? Applicable protocols, again, um, those are the things that we typically use ICDs for, whereas the OIAs we typically use for team to team within the mission operations uh, area. Um, okay, so processes, and I'm I'm looking at the time just to make sure, I think we got about another, I should be able to wrap this up in about 10 minutes at the most, but please stop me if you have questions. Um, so next level of detail is processes. So you saw the scenarios before, right? This is a, this is based on a different scenario, but uh, the process lays out the steps to be performed to carry out that scenario, specifically teams that are performing it, and what the exact products are that are being exchanged between different steps. And so this guides what your interfaces, what your OIAs need to be. So a process must have input information and products identified, output information and products, which team and role provides what performs which steps, and what timing and decisional points exi exist. So a couple examples of that. Input files are over here. DSN tracking updates, the trajectory, um, a lot of these are, well, here we go, wrap, reference activity plan, uh, strategic science planning guide. Those are all inputs to the long range plan, right? Um, we go to the next step, we do what's called a reference activity. It's a plan update. This is our plan. We're going to update it. Um, we want this done, you know, we're going to do this repetitively, but if we're less than eight weeks to execution, then we're going to jump into are more detailed planning cycles. So we're gonna go to science and instrument. We're gonna go, okay, what do you wanna to plan to do? Um, they're gonna get an updated long range mission plan. So here's the current plan. Now you work in the details of this four weeks that you want essentially. They're gonna work on it and give us back an update. Here's the detail I wanna change for the next four weeks. Uh, and if you're under four weeks execution, then you're ready to basically push that through all of the software to generate the actual uplink products. And that's where you go into sequence planning and generation. And out of that, you have things like your final plan, your uplink summary, your spacecraft predix based on the sequences. Um, and then you have the actual uplink products that go to your mission control team to execute the pass. Now we use colors in the, in our framework basically to indicate the teams and I didn't put that key code on here but um but the bottom line is that each of these little documents that you see here all of these need to be listed in an OIA somewhere we don't have an OIA for every one of these actual items that would be considered a product phase you can but then you're writing one OIA for every product you're developing at every in every process you're doing it what we do is we try to build it by team instead. So you may have, like right here, you have an interface between your sequence team, your mission planning sequence team, and, a, and your mission control team, which is the ACE who's going to radiate this. They will have an OIA that says, I'm going to give you uplink products and DSN station products, which is the predix for the DSN keyword file. And I'm going to give them to you every Monday at two o'clock, and they're going to get them from this location on our data storage file system. And this is what they're going to look like. And that would be one OIA. So this, this basically, when you des design your process and you put it in here, makes developing your OIAs much easier. Um, so let's see. So after you get a process, the next final detail is procedures. And all this happens over, it could happen over a year, two years, many years. Um, I've been on Europa Clipper now for... Oh, uh, eight, almost eight years. I think it'll be eight years this, this fall. So, um, and so we have been going through all of these steps and we are just now in our first six months or so of working on procedures. So all of this stuff sort of happens over time as you're necking down your design. Um, your procedures are your final detailed instructions on how you're going to do your operations. It's exact steps. 
what software you're using, how, what to type on the command line, right? What, how do you run that tool with what settings? That's the detail of the procedures. You also have some kind of procedures called on console procedures, which in, I think, most of the earth orbiting missions um, and some of the other uh, non-deep space missions, can, we'll call these scripts, basically, ops scripts, um, where during a pass, you may run a script that is going to look at the data that came down and it's going to send up your commands, essentially, right? And so they can include the commanding, the receiving telemetry and the interface between the two and do checks in real time um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're running an on console on contact thing, you want a procedure that says exactly what you're going to do and when you're going to do it and what data you need to be able to move on to the next step. And so that's essentially what a procedure is. Um, we have what we call team procedures that give instructions for what a given role would have to do for a certain function. So there's different levels of procedure. Some are very technical and will list telemetry channels and command products and things like that. Some are very general, like who you need to call when there's an anomaly, right? That would be a procedure as well. Who do I notify? When do I notify them? How soon? Um, you know, how often do we meet to work out the details of the next plan? Some of this stuff all comes into procedures. Um, and then finally, other considerations, I want to talk about testing and training. So two key steps in getting ready for mission operations is you got to test your system just like any other system. And you've got to train the people that are part of your system on how to use it. So do all those elements come together correctly? There's two kinds of testing, uh, and, I, and that's the general V and V category, right? There's verification and there's validation. Verification, does your system satisfy the requirements? Did you build it right? Did you build the system so that it meets the requirements? Validation is another step that's very important for operations because we do, I think, we do verification, but the more important step that really involves people is validating that the system works. And that is, does the system really do what you intended it to do correctly? Did you build the right system? So you have, did you build the system right? But then did you build the right system? And so that's a, it's a balance between both Vs of the V and V. Um, and so one of the things you're testing is the, uh, the people as part of an element of the team, right? And that is usually done in what we call operational readiness testing. And that's at the very last step when everything is ready, your spacecraft is already built, it's gone through uh, assembly and test. Um, you're getting ready to launch, you're getting ready to operate, and you need to test that the team knows how to do the thing they're going to do. Some people consider these rehearsals, but they really are a test. They are a test of whether the whole system can come together. Can you command that system? With, can the people do what they need to? Can they use the software in the way they're meant to use it? Can they respond? Do they know how to respond? And the fun part of it is you get to put them through. Um, you also can take credit for this as training uh, to some degree because you get to put people through the paces of having to make decisions on the fly and see if they're ready and if they have the right information at their hands to do the job that they need to do. So for training, your operations team, you do walkthroughs of the all of the materials I just showed you. One of the first things we're going to do is we're going to take that material and we're going to sit down with people who haven't necessarily seen it yet that are coming onto the team to get ready for operations. Um, and we're going to walk through all those processes and we're going to walk through the details of the procedures and answer questions about them. We're going to do what we call flight schools, um, which are training sessions to learn all about the flight, the flight system itself. How does the attitude control system work? What are the, the constraints and the flight rules associated with power, the power system on the spacecraft? So we have, to we have to make sure we capture all that and that we can train the team to, do, to, to learn that. Software tool training, we're doing that now. Um, voice network protocols. You know, if you're if you got a whole bunch of people in mission operations and they're all on, on their console, they all have their headsets on and they're all, you gotta regulate how, who's going to talk when and what networks are going to talk on and who's got what responsibility to communicate what. So not only do you have to design that and document it, but then you need to train people in it and you need to see how they do. I will never forget on one of the missions I was on, we were doing an operational readiness test and we had two rooms and one of them was inside sort of a glassed in room and then there was a bigger bullpen outside and we were in the middle of getting the power status and uh, we did a call out, you know, power, what's your, are you go or no, no go, what's your status? 
And then we heard silence, but we looked outside the window and we saw the guy talking, but we couldn't hear him. And we realized it's a push to talk system because it was kind of an older school headset and you have to push the button to talk. And he hadn't trained on this system before. So during this operational readiness test and training exercise, we basically caught that and was like, no, you need to push the button because nobody can hear you. <laughs> so um things like that happen and that's why you that's why you train and train again and train again um you rehearse 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 if you are doing overnight operations okay let's say you're doing um you know 24 7 operations for a launch shift right and you get put on the graveyard shift and so you're going to be working overnight um you know the, you don't want the day you have to show up for that shift that you're supporting launch operations overnight to be the first time you've ever tried staying up all, all night and sleeping during the day. You need to practice that. And so when we do operational readiness tests, we practice that. We put people on the right shifts that they're going to be working in the real event so they get used to it. Does your neighbor have a dog that barks all day and you can't sleep? Do you not have blackout curtains in your room? Do you, you know, you learn this stuff because you put yourself in the environment and you rehearse it. And it's important for you as a person who's doing operations to rehearse it. Right. And this is all stuff you have to think about when you're building and designing your system, because you have to think about how am I going to train my people? What kinds of things do I need to do to train the people and test the people and test the system? And all of it boils down to certifying your operators before they sit in that ops chair. And so they're ready to go on the day when it comes and they know exactly what to do. So um, inevitably, though, no matter how much you prepare, Things will go wrong. They always go wrong. And they always go wrong in the way you least expect them to. I guarantee it. Um, we have been surprised on every every mission. You know, there's always something that you just don't think about. You do your best to think about it ahead of time. So your flight system developers are going to be thinking about the onboard fault protection, right? The thing that's going to, if you send up a sequence, it's going to try to draw too much power. That onboard fault protection is going to help, is going to protect you, can it keep you safe in flight. But the MOS developers have to know what could happen on the spacecraft and what they will do when an anomaly occurs on the ground, how to quickly identify it, how to isolate the root cause, and how to recover back to nominal operations. And not only do you have to think about all of how that would come together, document it, you have to practice it too. Um, most importantly, you want to do this early while they're still building the spacecraft and while they're still writing the software for the spacecraft. Because you need to make sure that on the ground, you have a sufficient amount of the right information in your hands coming from the telemetry for you to be able to determine unambiguously the state of that system. No pressure. Uh, because if you are, if you're looking at the kind of telemetry you're going to get down, you go, well, I'm only getting it every 10 minutes and the stuff changes on the one second boundary, you know, you're not, you're going to miss a lot. Right. So you have to be able to think about how you're going to assess the state of your system and respond to what's wrong with it in time to be able to affect the flight software, essentially, before, before they finalize it to say, make sure you put enough of the right telemetry so that I know what I need to look at. Um, and then we eventually use red alarms to indicate when something is out of bounds. But that sufficient amount is something that is really hard to do, but very important. Um, you're going to build procedures for things like recovery from safe mode, loss of uplink, loss of downlink, high risk contingencies. You're even going to put products and sequence products, sort, sort of what we call on the shelf, essentially. You're going to build them and they're going to be waiting in the file system and then you're going to pull them out and approve them and throw them up there quickly for things that you know you want to do often. Uh, and you're going to exercise all of these in your operational readiness tests. So, um, Michael, how am I doing on time? Because I didn't get to operability. Can I keep going or do you want me to wrap it up? You can absolutely keep going. All right. Thank you. Uh, good, because this is the fun part. <laughs> um, okay, operability. Um, operability is recognition that there might be a better way to design, build, and operate flight systems. So notice, I'm not saying a better way to build your operation system. I'm talking about operability of a flight system. But the people who care about the operability of a flight system are the people who are designing the mission operation system. Because again, they are interrelated. 
um, consider, so things you want to do when you're thinking about oper operability is considering how the decisions made early in the design phase of the flight system, the flight element, will impact your mission operations. Is it going to have solar arrays? If so, do you have to manage how those solar arrays are articulated? Uh, those kinds of things. Aiming to make the system easy, intuitive, safe, and efficient to operate. So those are four big ones. You want it to be easy. You want it to be intuitive to the operator because when you're designing it and you're building it, the person who's going to fly it might still be in kindergarten right now with some of these long duration missions. Um, you want to design it with the user in mind and what the software is that the user is going to have in front of them when they're doing it. Uh, and incorporating really important, incorporate lessons learned from past missions and from the ops community. There's actually an ISO standard on spacecraft operability that was developed based, that basically comes up with a set of, of requirements, typical requirements that you should have on a flight system to make it more operable, things you wanna consider. So we use that very early on in Europa Clipper and identified a whole set of operability requirements on the system. Um, in the end, one of the things to, unfortunately to keep in mind is that operability is only one stake in, in all of the design, it's one factor, but cost, schedule, things like that, sometimes way more than operability, but you have to do your best to try. So what is operability? The simplest terms, we came up with a definition based on the ISO standard one and tailored it a little bit for Europa Clipper, um, but it describes how easy a system is to operate. So it's a feature of the end-to-end -end system, not just the mission operation system, but the flight and ground segments that enables the ground segment comprising the hardware, software, personnel, and procedures to operate the space segment during the complete mission lifetime using a minimum of resources, maximizing the quality, the quantity, and the availability or timeliness of delivery of mission products without compromising spacecraft safety. There's a lot packed in there, but it, it's, but it's all, it all ties together into what we mean by operability. Um, so it's a key factor in enabling a smaller team to more cost effectively and safely operate a spacecraft. The smaller the team, the lower the operations costs are. People are expensive. When you're talking about a 10-year mission and you're talking about a team of 40 people who have to be there full time for 10 years, that's a big cost. So if you can do anything in the design of the spacecraft to maybe let you operate with 35 people instead of 40, because a lot of the stuff is automated on board, or if the simplicity of the information that's being given to ground to the ground and the handholding they have to do is minimized, then you could save costs and operations. So it's more than human factors, but we do want to consider human factors. Do you want a, a system that requires you to work 24 seven to always touch base with it? No, you want it to be out on its own and work for four to six weeks on its own without having to hear from a human. That's more operable, right? And that's also better for your human factors because you're not asking people to do long you know, overnight shifts. Um, but you also don't want to just do operability just because you want operability. You have to have a reason that the operability outweighs potentially the cost or the schedule impacts on the development of the mission. Risk is another side of it. So you always have to balance all of those together, making it operable, making it cost effective, keeping your schedule and reducing your risk. So we've uh, on Clipper, um, we went through a major effort early in pre-phase A, which is like really early before you even do your system requirements development um, and early phase A. And we de developed a, a nine aspects of operability. And this is a description of them, but um, I won't go into too much detail at this point, but you can see a lot of merilities, right? Things like observability need to be able to have the visibility of what's going on with your system. You have to be able to control it. You have to be able to predict what it's going to do. Um, a lot of these actually go, uh, some of them compete against each other. Flexibility may counter simplicity, for instance. Simplicity is not necessarily one of the ones that's on here because of that. Simplicity doesn't mean as much by itself, but if you think about flexibility, Having more flexibility may provide more complexity to your system, but if having that flexibility makes you more robust, then that's a good thing. So 
Um, it's a balance between all nine of these aspects, and you want to try to achieve the best you can on each of these nine aspects and design your mission operations system with these in mind in a way that, that you will be able to minimize your cost and your impact to your human operators. So I think that's it. Um, let me, uh, the, the bottom line is why are we doing this, right? And back to the beginning when we talked about we're rewriting science textbooks. We are, you know, providing discoveries all over the universe to uh, to students, to the general public, um, you know, bringing this sense of discovery from up there down to earth for everybody to see. So when you get to the to the point of of you know you finally built this system that you've been you've architected it you've designed it you've practiced it you've rehearsed it you've tested the heck out of it you've made it as operable as you can so then what this is what it looks like in the end right and I put in here a bunch of a bunch of different pictures of old and new and how things have morphed over time from the Apollo control room at Johnson Space Center in the past. Um, to what Johnson Space Center uh, looks like nowadays, um, basically for um, human spaceflight operations. Um, we've got JPL Spaceflight Operations Facility back in 2005, um, which uh, basically this is a, a historic landmark. It's been open 24 seven for, I can't even tell you how many years um, and has operated every deep space mission and all the data from any space mission comes through this air, this uh, JPL Space Flight Operations Facility. Um, this is what it looks like today over here on the right. Um, and, you know, you've got basically your traditions that tie everybody together. Um, at JPL, there's the lucky peanuts that get passed around right before you launch every mission or do any major critical event. Um, everybody passes around the jar of peanuts and you eat the peanuts for good luck. And usually it works. So <laughs> there's a whole story behind it. You can Google it. It's, it's, a, it's a good story. But this is what you're looking for, right? Here in the middle, all the discoveries, right? This is what we're gonna, what we're gonna go do, what we're gonna go see. And your operation system is what makes this possible as part of the, the whole big picture. And the reward as being a team member, carrying some of this stuff out is just, incredible. So you've got your Mars Perseverance landing team over here on the left, and you can just see the excitement in everybody's eyes. Uh, this is the Dawn operations, uh, mission operations. So it's a little smaller. It's not as fancy, but we were a discovery mission. We did what we could do on our budget, and we had a great time doing it. Um, I got to sit in this chair right here. This is our mission management seat, um, and I was the second shift mission manager for, for launch ops, and it was absolutely fantastic. So uh, something I would never give up. So there you go. That is what it's all for. And in the back, I've got just some definitions and some acronyms, and that's it. So questions? That was excellent. That was great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. My name is Noah Moyers. I am the um, flight software lead for our project. Ah, great. Nice um, to meet you. It's, it's nice to meet you, too. Thank you for the presentation today. It, a lot of valuable information. Definitely adding this to the list of seminars that students have to watch when they get onboarded to the flight software team. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, it would. It'll be invaluable for them to be able to have a more complete picture of interaction with the Mission Operations Center. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have a couple of questions. So data that's, um, I guess, diagnostics data that's downlinked from the satellite to the Mission Operations Center. How is it typically, or I guess, do you know how it's typically represent, represented internally on the satellite itself? So from the flight software perspective. So would it be, like, would we be downlinking something like E532? And then they would be processing on ground that would interpret that error code to give a detailed interpretation of the error on yeah. ground. So, so there's various, depending on the design of the system, right? There's various uh, formats you could have. You can have uh, an event record or EVR type of thing, which would be a message that is decoded on the ground, basically that just says this event happened at this time. Um, you can also get packetized telemetry 
which um, is usually or channelized telemetry, which is the, the, the actual telemetry values are coming down and then the ground is putting them into a channel that then you see all of the values for that channel over time. Um, but usually the, the format of the data is packets that are put into frames that are then wrapped and sent down as PDUs to the ground using uh, CFTP, depending on if you're using CFTP. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's mostly packetized information wrapped in frames sent down and then decoded on the ground and opened up to be processed in a way that the humans can read it. Um, you have uh, sometimes DN to EU conversions on the ground, right? So if you have a, uh, a data number that comes down, that means nothing, like you said, E5, E352, what does that mean? Turns into an engineering unit on the ground that actually gives you the, in the, uh, the information of the units that you would, would expect to see it in. Does that make sense? No, that, that makes complete sense. Thank you. No, that definitely answers my question. We're just um, in the early stages of flight software design, so it's just something that we want to keep in mind. Yeah, uh, so it's it's one of the one of the, the rules we have on our spacecraft also is that if you're going to send anything down in real time, meaning you're going to have these packets that are streaming down that you're going to basically see as they come in, um, you also want to be able to be recording those on board and sending them down as like a data product after the fact, right? So that you can send them later, so that if you drop contact, when you're getting this real-time stream, you're not dependent on it. You can play it back later from the spacecraft. So that's that's an area of design I think that's important for flight software to consider as well. Thank you. No, we um, will... And actually, I'm really excited that, that you think this is important for flight software because I always tell people, I go to the, there's a flight software workshop that happens uh, either at APL or JPL every other year or something like that. Um, and I always tell people in mission oper operations, go to the flight software workshop and learn how flight software is built and how it works, because it is our way of controlling and operating the spacecraft. It is the tool we have to make the spacecraft do what we need to. And if we don't get involved from the mission operations sense early on with flight software, you know, we're the user of the software. And so if you're not talking to the user, you're not going to have a good system. And so it works both ways. The mission operations needs to be coming to flight software and saying, hey, I really need this capability. And the flight software needs to go, hey, user, how do you want to use the system? So it's great that you're thinking about that now. Now, I mean, I completely agree with everything that you just said. And that is, I'm very excited for all this information. Um, I also did have one more question, if that's all right. Do you have, um, I guess, any potential recommendations for GDS software that we should potentially consider selecting? Because we haven't actually selected a GDS. Are they typically developed in-house? It should be noted, uh, we are using F prime uh, yes. out, of J out of JPL, um, but J uh, is Amos the GDS? at jpl right and Am amos is not public right um it's not jpl specific but i think it's nasa right i don't think we can use amos so uh public gds i guess should be the question yes i know i attended a uh, workshop in october at jpl for um f prime Okay. That's a, a flight software um, framework that's being developed at JPL. Okay. And they mentioned um, AMPCS as a GDS software that, that is potentially going to be open sourced around and made publicly available around June 2023. So in a few months. Okay, that's great. Yeah, because that and that is the the MGSS develops the AMOS software and AMPCS is a component of that. And so, um, yeah, that it'd be great if they make that open source and more available. Um, it's, uh, yeah, um, there's another set of planning software and planning tools that's also being developed that is, is going to be made open source, uh, I believe, called ARI. Um, and that, that focuses more around the planning and the command generation from a plan. So you can integrate that kind of stuff on the ground on your planning side. So, whereas the AMPCS does your commanding in your, in your downlink, um, processing essentially. So, um, but they, yeah, they're, that, that's interesting. I'd, I'd be happy. I'd be excited to see when that actually starts to happen. 
no, I'm, I definitely am excited for it because it would make our lives substantially easier not yeah. having to develop that in-house. Um, yeah, because we use yeah. AMPCS and and I, I haven't heard of F prime, but um, but now I'm going to go look it up. So it's a great framework. It's awesome. it has a very very steep learning curve, but it's yeah. great. Good. Noah, we should be looking to put a uh, a wrapper around AMPCS, or at least an interface between our uh, project management platform and the GDS and the ARI, if if it if it works for us. We we'll can have to discuss. Yeah, I'll yeah. we'll have to discuss that more in detail. Yeah, because I'm not quite sure what you're wanting there. Oh, we'll talk about it later. All right. So I had. Oh, you got another one? Go for it. No, I don't have a third question. I was just clarifying. So AMPCS, if they do open source that, is that something that you definitely do think that we should use? Yeah, it, it's it's all in one package. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. I think it's it's a good one. Um, and I don't have much else to compare to just because I've been, you know, at everything else that other than the stuff at JPL, we've always used what's provided through MGSS, which is the AMPCS um, um, system right now. Um, and before then, everything I've been familiar with has been homegrown. So um, like when I worked with Berkeley, they had their own system that they had used a heritage system and end system that they had in place for all the missions that they were operating. You know, um, depending on um, what else has been used for what previous missions, it's all a lot of it is based on an inheritance. So if you're starting from scratch, it's kind of hard to dig around. I don't know what else is out there, but. <laughs> okay, well, I definitely appreciate the information. And how is Airy spelled? Oh, it's A-E-R-I-E. And I don't think it, I don't know if it's open source yet. They're still building it. They're basically they're just just getting to the first first releases of it. It's something we're planning on using. Um, uh, but it it should be coming maybe similar time frame, maybe twenty twenty four. I'm not sure, but uh, but they're talking about going open source with that. All right. And they are. I know they are talking to other NASA customers, so it's not JPL specific. It's not JPL internal. Definitely exciting. So it's either going to be open source or technology transfer. Yeah. Okay. Um, I only had a, a couple of brief things. You mentioned early on uh, that there was a paper on the MOC architecture that worked for many projects. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing that paper, I'd love to read that. Okay. Yeah, I will find that. Absolutely. That would be super helpful. And my, my the last question that I didn't ask uh, during the, the, the seminar regards the science instrument data. So you're obviously interfacing with several um, science operation centers with a, a variety of instruments on Europa Clipper. When you are uh, providing that science data to your science operation centers, do the SOCs ask for the data in a certain format? Is it bits in, bits out? Are you processing the data before sending it to them? What's what's the strategy there? That's a really good question. So um, we tried to have one interface, basically. So we have an element within our system that I didn't really show in detail what um, called the, excuse me, the mission SDS, so mission science data system. And that's the once the data comes out of, you know, from the DSN and the packets are there, that basically goes to the mission SDS and the mission SDS separates out the data products that need to go to the science instrument center. So, um, and there's, we wanted one format, we ended up with two because uh, we settled on the PDS4 raw product, essentially. So all of that packetized information comes in, they create the PDS4 raw product for the instrument teams and then ship those off to them. Um, but there are some that want their raw packets. And so there is really no processing except making sure that gaps are filled and that everything was received and then and that there's accountability data that goes with it. And then we send, send, ship that off as the raw packetized data to the instrument teams. And then they take it and do their processing on it. So it, it's raw data. The, the default is PDS4 unless they ask for raw data. Yep. And, and some of them already had the pipeline set up to to handle the raw the raw product, so they want okay. that. And PDS in this context is the planetary data system. Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, Kathy, 
this has been phenomenal. <laughs> we got a lot out of this. Uh, I'm I'm super excited to have this, and of, of course, um, for for several of our teams, this is definitely going to be uh, must watch content. Uh, we, we have a couple students, uh, Salon. Y'all, do you have any questions, any at all? Uh, Kathy has uh, offered her valuable time for us. I, I think we must have must have covered it. Um, Kathy, thank you so much. We really appreciate this. Uh, ev everything that you've done for us. Um, appreciate your time and your insight. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. I enjoy it. So happy to answer any other questions too. Um, and uh, hopefully everybody got something good out of this that they can take forward. Even if it's not mission operations, it's still something you can apply to a system you're working on somewhere. So. Thanks a lot. Thank you. With that, uh, this, you. this uh, S3 is closed. Uh, Y'all have a wonderful evening. All right. See ya.